I'm bringing you in to talk about film and criticism and the things you do professionally, but I also uh -huh. promised you a, a, a platform. <laughs> I'd platform your Russell Wilson takes. Is that what you want to talk about with your, your blank piece of paper in front of you that I'll let you write anything on? He's just a beautiful person. He's just a beautiful person, and I think Sierra is the luckiest <laughs> human being on earth. I don't know what it's like to play football with this man. I don't have any idea. But I can tell you to just, like, behold him. When you say beautiful, you, that, that's almost too poetic for the feeling that I think you're really describing here. Do you want me to say he's hot? I mean, you're lots the Pulitzer people, Prize winning critic. Lots of people are hot. This is a different, I mean, there's a kind of person, and these people are rare, where, like, you could, like, they look like they're made of pudding. You know, like, part of the beauty is they also seem edible somehow. <laughs> right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in the league and give you a really, like, nauseating example of this. Because I'm already nauseated. I, oh, really? I mean, Russell Wilson, you, he's not cool, though. I don't care. What do I, what? What is my what is my what do my desires have to do with cool? <laughs> I mean, like y'all can have Ryan Gosling, just take him. That's right. I don't. I'll I take don't the scorpion that. jacket. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You can you can do that guy all day long. Everybody makes fun of Russell Wilson, but I think everybody's jealous. <laughs> I think he is the most handsome man in the NFL. You had pudding and edible and what was the name in the league oh, that you, you were know what? compare him to? You know what? I can't do it to everybody. It's bad. I mean, to, what? Your, to your point, like it is actually bad enough that I am saying this about Russell Wilson. Um, it's a safe space. It, it's not safe enough to say what I was about to say. <laughs> I really, I really, because I think better of myself, but there is another person involved in professional football who is not a player who also has this kind of like creamy edible quality. It's just that you also would get food poisoning and Ooh. nobody wants that. Wait, who are we, who are we talking about? I can't. Who are we I talking about? What if we bleep the name? Because I've already said, because I've already said too much. It's Andy Reid. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Is it easier or harder to describe to people who don't know what your job is, what your job is these days? Mm, these days? Yeah, like the present tense. Like, do you do you think there was a period in which it was easier, might have been easier for me to do it? <laughs> well, I went to college and I took a class in American film criticism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In 2005, Elvis Mitchell was my professor. Shit. Okay, yeah. well, you got, you got something good. Well... New York Times critic Elvis Mitchell would commute to Cambridge mm -hmm. and he would lecture once a week for three hours. Mm. We'd watch movies. Oh, you were in the famous, you yeah. were in that class. American film criticism. Okay. Yes, taught by this dreadlocked anti-professor professor <laughs> who was like the cool guy, like the iconoclast on campus. Yeah. And it was so popular because we watched movies and he's entertaining. Um, but the point is, I took a class about criticism and of course we read Pauline Kael. Mm -hmm. We wrote about like... Uh, Gus Van Sant, and I wrote about, like, Elephant. And, oh, ooh. Yeah, I know, real, a, real academic stuff. But the point is, mm. if I'm thinking about what criticism has become in the last, that was 05, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 2024 now, I imagine the class is just something that almost needs to define itself in the context of the present, of, of, the, of the genre being different. And so, let me ask it this way. Hmm. When was it easiest to describe what it is that you do professionally? I mean, probably in 1972. Probably. I mean, I'm going to guess I wasn't around in 1972. Right. But my, my definition would probably be the same 50 years ago and now. But essentially what you're sort of doing now is defining the job of a critic in opposition to or or maybe as a point of clarification with respect to what people are doing on the internet, for instance, right? Exactly. Um, which, to be fair or honest or real or accurate, um, is itself a form of criticism, depending on who we're talking about. I mean, the act, the noun, criticism, is being practiced by yes. everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in a way that makes me want to demand from you 
the definition. What is it that you do? How, how do you actually describe it now? You want to try to use your voice and imagination and mind and personality to think through what a work of culture art moment in art or culture is doing and and means. So I figure I should also just jump in here and start to define who Wesley Morris is himself because the Academy Awards happen to be this Sunday. And so what I wanted to do today was just sit down with the only writer in history to ever win the Pulitzer Prize for criticism more than once. First with the Boston Globe in 2012, then again with the New York Times in 2021. And that is where Wesley still is, by the way. He is the critic at large at the New York Times. And he also covers culture generally. But as for our popular understanding of what professional criticism actually is, I mean, in the world of movies, we're all familiar with this general idea, right? Because there's this Siskel and Ebert, thumbs up or thumbs down, customer service aspect to that job. I, for a long time, it resisted that idea because in my, my literal brain was like, well, no, I'm not providing, this is not Consumer Reports. This is the daily newspaper. And I, I really just want to work through my feelings. That's all it starts off as being for me. Like, how do I feel? Well, I'm not really going to know until I sit down alone and work through my feelings through words. Um, and once it's clear where I'm going as I'm writing, then you can start to do all the magical things that you really don't have any control over, like language, the sort of word connections. I mean, there's a conscious part, but then there's an unconscious part. The service being provided is not, is this good or is this bad, right? Um, you truly can get that from lots of different places you don't need a person like me. You can just go to Metacritic. I don't need words. Or Rotten Tomatoes. Right. I can right? go to the to the statistical index that is those places. Are we looking say, at marinara or are we looking at, at a at a whole tomato? And I mean Is that, that threatening though? No, it, no. It, what does Rotten Tomatoes, what is Metacritic, these things that say um 95 it, it gives you a grade basically right. if you're a director. What does that do for your profession? If I'm being honest, I'm just as dependent on that quantification in other realms as other people are with respect to movies, right? Of course. Am I going to go to a restaurant that's rated 3.7? Do you know what I mean? Like on an, on any service? I don't think so. You know, if I'm t if I'm going to a country I've never been to before, um and I don't know what some of these places are and I'm 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 winging it. Most of the time I'm doing this, I'm taking the advice of people when I travel. But I think though just just pure and simple, those ratings have a value, right? There is at least a baseline that you can judge your experience by in some way as a as a moviegoer, as a diner. I think there is a value for that, but I also think that in the same way that I am talking to people who I respect before I travel somewhere about where they like to eat, I think it's great to, in addition to having the metrics to tell you what most people are into, I think the, there's, a, there's an additional value to having a relationship with one or two people who do the thing all the time, right? Who go to a lot of restaurants, who watch a lot of movies. There is a record of their dining and, and reading and movie going experience. Yeah, there's a rigor to their uh to their to their opinions. Maybe not, right? Like I don't even know that it has to, it just should be somebody you trust. That person could have terrible taste. But I think it it should be somebody that you can eventually develop your own taste by. And maybe you wind up breaking up with that critic because you realize they aren't rigorous and they aren't doing the work and that you now know more than they do and they suck. Right, they think Russell Wilson's super hot, for instance. Oh my God. Just, you went, okay. <laughs> sure, sure. He might have a 3.7 <laughs> according to everybody else, but I've been to that restaurant and I'm telling you, it's a 4.9. <laughs> Just saying. People will ask me, journalism students, like, what should I do if I want to do what you do? And I have settled upon a thought that I want your help 
sussing out. Okay. Because the thought I have is you should develop a defined taste. Mm-hmm. Know what you like mm-hmm. and how to explain why you like it and mm-hmm. know what you don't like mm-hmm. and be able to do the same. Mm-hmm. How did you develop your taste? When we say I have taste, it usually is meant like positively, you know, that the taste is good. Um, I realized very early in my life that I liked, I had bad taste, right? Like I was interested in like not gore, not necessarily vile. I liked, you know, my first John Waters experience was was a life-changing thing. The most sorted, the dirtiest, the weirdest, the rudest, the meanest. Anything that I could identify as being truly funny in a in a like I as a kid, I watched a lot of stand-up comedy. And it was very clear to me who my favorite people were versus the people who did nothing for me. Do you have somebody that you still think of as like an influence in terms of taste? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was all those women. I grew up in the 80s and the early 90s. Adele Givens, Elaine Boozler, Judy Tenuta, who is a real weirdo. Do these names mean anything to you? I could not plead more ignorance. This is a very obvious, ex- I mean, this is going to surprise you a little bit. Andrew Dice Clay didn't really do it for me because it was such a shtick. And I didn't... The performance I didn't, of I'm a bad boy. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It was such a performance and it was so off Elvis and so rat packy. I know what you're saying. Cute comic, but he's got an attitude. <laughs> so fuck you. Then, I mean, if you sort of boil it all down, this is a, this is a handsome man who hates himself and is doing everything in his power to, like, direct that hate somewhere else. And that was clear to me as a kid, and it just <laughs> turned me off. But you know who I liked in a not dissimilar vein? Sam Kinison. Mm. There was something really musical about I mean, I guess we could argue about the musicality of Dice Clay. But Sam Kinison, he came at, he was at the exact right pop rock and roll moment, right? People walk up to me, they act like they're looking at the angel of death. It's like, oh! The screaming punchlines that Sam Kinison had about, you know, dis- disappointment, insult. You know, I read the Bible. I follow the calendar. I think it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus said anything to anybody. <laughs> I think his last words may have been, I just loved that. And obviously this fat guy with a big mouth, not in telling like really tasteless jokes, bad taste. Um, but I I loved him. And so I think the more I got exposed to this sort of seedy underbelly side of people, my first Barbara Streisand movie was Nuts, mm. a movie called Nuts in which she plays a call girl who has to kill a John because he's trying to assault her and she goes on trial for being insane. That's my first Barbara Streisand movie. Not Funny Girl. <laughs> you have a fairly disturbed childhood. I mean, my childhood was great. My mom loved me and so did my dad. They, I was, I was loved, but I also liked some really distasteful, discourteous, rude shit. So part of your origin story here is the desire to um, explain why it is that you felt like the stuff that people looked down on was actually some of the greatest shit that you had seen and vice versa. I'm a big proponent of trash as an aesthetic and as a practice. I think the Real Housewives franchise is the only reality experience you can have that, that satisfies all all of the parameters that I would lay out for what constitutes a great work of trash. Mm. And even Ryan though- Ryan Court says, our producer, sorry, I can just hear him. He's <laughs> cheering that a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner is saying this, but please proceed. I, you know, I don't watch everything, but I've seen more than enough to understand that the values of those shows are basically, a they're basically human beings. They're trying to work out how to be human beings, right? 
And what these women are actively resisting is being present, right? Mm. And so you have <laughs> this tension between women who don't want to be where they are and want to be somewhere else. And what comes out of that is like, like what is the most obnoxious, horrible, mean, awful thing I can do just to get out of here? And to be off in, what do they call the little confessionals? Yeah, yeah, confessional. Like, I want to go do a confessional. I don't want to be here giving the material to make the confessional. Um, so the performance of self-consciousness is itself, in this world, a trashy achievement. Do you give them credit for being as compelling as you've just out— So this gets to the notion of, like, authority— like what's intent? Authorial intent, Wesley. Yes. Do you give them credit? Is it so part of the it, it, uh, weirdly, I will mention Stephen A. Smith here mm. because part of the comedy of him existing and like naming his favorite Pokemon and he, being a love doctor, just super horny on air is him not always being in on it. OK, so I love this. I love this. Stephen A. Smith to me is not a trash artist. He's camp, right? Mm. Where the thing that is so serious and true and earnest about him is also completely ridiculous. How many pillows is the right amount to sleep with, Stephen A? I say two personally. I agree with you. I think three is too much. I think one's too little. Two is just right because you can put one laid down and one standing up or you can put one on top of the other. Either way it goes, it should work for you if your pillows are right. And he has no control over how ridiculous he is on a on a minute by minute basis, right? <laughs> I mean, just just his his look alone. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, irresistible. The, it, I mean, you watch it. Be, I mean, it's hard to. I mean, I have very mixed feelings about experiencing this man. But but the but the but the fact of him, the right? Character the, that he embodies is irresistible because. You're saying there is a, a camp level of theatricality. Yes, yes. But also, he has no control over it. And that's so important, right? That he's not a scientist engineering the response. He couldn't. It's, it is, in fact, uh, carnal. It's so much bigger than he is. It's an id. Right, yes. No, I mean, it is truly an id. But it also is an id that never had the the sort of girding of a superego, right? Right. Like, there's nobody who can make this guy go back inside his body. And I would never want to try. No. I mean... I mean... <laughs> imagine producing... <laughs> imagine producing him, right? I've actually... You know what? It's funny. I've never heard a story from anybody about having, like, a... I was in an elevator with Stephen A. Smith. Uh, I ran into Stephen A. Smith in a parking lot. Um, he came over to my table while I was having, I've never heard like, a. he was whispering. He was, I feel like whatever it is to be on in him, it, the, it's not even, I hate the phrase, there's no off switch, but I mean, he doesn't have any other mode, right? Like this, I, I, I showed him a picture of a sonogram, my daughter's <laughs> oh, like no. imaging in the makeup room during, in between shows one day. And what he told me, <laughs> instead of saying like, congratulations, this is great was, uh, and I won't even begin to imitate him. Basically that you are going to want to defend this child's life to the point where you will kill a man. And he gave this monologue about just like the violence I will want to exact upon someone mm. to defend this, this image. And I said to myself, this man is exactly who he is all the time. Mm -hmm. There's also no thinking Right? I mean, it's thinking, I guess. It feels like, like instinct. Right. There's no there's no plan. And this is again what gets him to camp and not trash. He's not trashy. I want to go to the hypothetical world in which someone is like wanting to become a professional movie critic or mm -hmm. cultural critic, either one really at this point, the notion of how, how in demand that occupation is, what is your blunt assessment of how that's changed given that oftentimes we're not even the ones to type in the name? No. Like, you just, it's just given it's just to, there. as opposed to like you say, I want to go and consult my informed friend, an expert. That's like, 
so much more work than what's happening <laughs> now where they're giving it to you and saying, you like this. That's not that different from the old remote cable days, right? We now understand that there's a system behind the scenes of these these platforms that that claim to know what we were gonna like, but they don't. It's like it's they're they're basically bottom feeder studio executives, essentially that algorithm. Yes, right, absolutely. Like You're they, right. it's the lowest common denominator. You liked this, so we're gonna give you this, and it's kind of hilarious to me what they what they will follow something with. Because I'm actually curious, like, okay, I just watched Barbie. Now you're going to give me Working Girl. What do you think the connection is between these two <laughs> movies? Like, other than the fact that they star two very sexy blondes, right? But I do think that it's not that different from when you were hunting for something to watch in, in the old days. And, and you didn't have the ability to choose at all. Right. And it was already chosen for you. So you your your Wheel of Fortune would, like, just land on you know, National Lampoon's Vacation X, XYZ. And you'd be like, oh, I kind of like this movie. There's there's three more of them. Um, Clint Eastwood, I don't know who this guy is, but I, I'm into it. I'll, I'm going to watch The Beguiled next. Can you, can you explain how it is that you even got the, the, the idea to do this job? Wait, I actually want to ask you a, a related question. What happened at the end of Elvis's class? Because, did I mean, what was your experience lear learning this history and then practicing a little bit of it yourself? Oh, my experience personally was uh, revisited today as I was trying to find my final paper on Elephant by Gus Van Sant. <laughs> and I was like, I used, in my attempt to imitate New York Times film critics poorly. Uh, uh. So many adverbs. Janet Maslin is what you. That's were right. Okay, that's interesting. Right. But okay. just just the idea of like, oh, I was cosplaying as a critic, mm -hmm, which is to mm -hmm. say, I was channeling a voice that when I revisit it now makes me cringe so mm -hmm. hard that I yeah. turn inside out. Yeah, yeah, that I am I am trying to replicate um, sophistication with adverbs, which is yeah. the telltale sign that you're not actually confident in the verb you chose. Right. I've been doing this now um, in some capacity since I was 12 years old. Mm. I wrote for my I wrote for my middle school newspaper, my high school newspaper, my college newspaper, and during somewhere in that period, I wrote for the Philadelphia Daily News because I'm from Philadelphia, and they had this kids section called Yo Fresh Ink, and <laughs> they got all these kids to write for it. It was like it it's corny, but. It was legitimately cool. What were you like back then as 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 your takes were concerned? Pro but probably the same, but adverbier. Yeah. Right? Because I think that at some point the 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 things that separated the the big cats from the little cats was their command of English, right? There if we're talking about writing in English. Um, is their command of the fun that they have with the language. And for me, adverbs were fun. I just liked using them a lot because, you know, putting a lot of words in front of another word just seemed like a cool thing to do. There was one sentence that you wrote recently. Um, you reviewed uh, Jennifer Lopez's uh, oh allegorical film about her life, which we've also talked about on the show, incidentally. I, but you had a sentence. <laughs> where? You had a sentence devoid, <laughs> devoid of adverbs. And I think confidence in writing, just to illustrate the kind of writer you are, also comes from the confidence to do a short sentence. Oh, yeah. And you called Jennifer Lopez's allegory about love, and you compared it to, of course, uh, Beyonce, Lemonade. And you said, I believe the quote is something like, Call it Lulu Lemonade. Oh my God, this thing is so deep. Like, she basically, Jennifer Lopez, one of our great stars, one of our great global entertainers, um, took it upon herself to ask herself, I can do anything with all this money that I've got. What is the thing I'd like to do? I want to make something about um, my relationship to a, to a thing that's very important to me, and that's relationships. Um, but also, I want to work in the Zodiac. Yeah. I want to n think about all of my old relationships and why I've been married so many times. But I also want to think about how I can make this about getting better and, and being a better person. 
she's clearly working through something she's been through. And I'm like, okay, well, Beyonce has done this, right? Like, Lemonade is essentially about the the those the roadblocks, speed bumps, trap doors that she found herself being put through um, at a certain point in her marriage. And I'm like, these things are similar. And I there's no doubt in my mind that, that Jennifer Lopez watched Lemonade and thought, well, what would my version of this be? And because Jennifer Lopez is so... I think we don't think of her as being neurotic, but I think because her neurosis isn't verbal, it's physical, right? She is a physically restless human being. She's always in motion. She's always like... There's no peace in her in her body. Like her body is always going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's a great dancer. It's kind of like doing a a karate kata, as they called it, like a martial arts routine. That's. I mean, it is about self defense. Like a right? multi step self defense. There is performance. There is something about being like keeping out and protecting. Um, and you know, all that physical stuff just reminds me of like, if I, the Lulu lemonade thing came to me, I thought like, maybe there's a Gatorade joke to make or like a Kool-Aid joke to make, but they didn't feel right. And I didn't have it until I just sort of started working through what the persona is about. When you've got a joke that I think is going to resonate with people as a very concise, explanation of what the what the thing under consideration is yes you don't want to step on it you, you wanna, don't want to adverb it up right well not only that but you don't even want a clause exactly you don't want i mean because i actually was like well maybe i need a clause dicks like no all of your clause work has to go on the front end even if it costs you something a little bit in the rhythm of the setup you want to keep the referent as close to the referee right or you know you want to keep the two references basically together yeah so if you're making a comparison you can't you can't have like 200 words between the the setup and the punchline but the point here i think underlying all of it is that um there is a bite to that yes like j-lo reads that and is like feels like she's just been hit by a karate kick like well, there's, and I, not because you intended it mm -hmm, to hurt mm -hmm, her, mm -hmm. but just because it cuts through in one line to the stylization and the hollowness and the artifice of this performance of, of strength, but also vulnerability. Yes, yes, yes. That is, that is Pablo. <laughs> I mean, look, I took American film criticism as a sophomore in college. It's very good. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the things that I think in order to be able to do this job, I mean, you'll talk to any any actual artist, I and mean, I think there's artistry to 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 the to criticism. Absolutely. But if you talk to like a person who dances for a living or sings for a living or acts for a living or, you know, writes novels, um, or writes really anything, it plays a sport, right? Like just watching a great athlete do what they do. There's a freedom that, like, you know, even under pressure, there, like, you don't know that it's match point based on the way, you know, I mean, just to pick a person, Carlos Alcaraz is, like, returning the ball, right? I don't even think he thinks he's going to lose. Even when, he, even when he does lose, he is still playing, like, he's up, you know, 40 love. And I think that kind of freedom... In, 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 in what I do, it really is hard to come by. And I'm very lucky that I'm not on social media. I was going to say, you haven't tweeted in uh, about two years. Yeah. Which, congratulations. Thank you. I mean, I'm not proud You've of You've missed it, nothing. I just feel like for my own sanity and really for me to be able to like practice this freedom that I'm talking to you about. Absolutely, man. It, it, I don't think it comes... I don't think I have it if I'm thinking also about how to, what is the thing I'm going to extract from this piece then put it on the internet and then sit around and wait for everybody to gather around and, and applaud it or, you know, decry it. Well, it, it gets to the question of why you are writing things the way that you do. Why is your opinion this and not that? And I think for a lot of us who exist mostly by looking through the lens of a feedback loop, mm -hmm. you are trying to get the scientists to give you more pellets. 
Yeah. More pellets, please. Like yeah, I would like yeah, I would yeah. like to feel good. I want the serotonin. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. Oh my it's funny. It's, oh, I shouldn't tell Let's story. talk about the numbers. Wesley. Like I I I somebody came over to me today to to, to well, it's not it's too in the weeds. But basically, I don't know how the stuff I do does. I would prefer I mean, not to know for I my own stuff. I don't well. want to know. Do right. you know? I can know, but I would like to not right. make decisions based on the scientist giving me exactly, pellets. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So I I just don't, I don't know how the pieces do. I still have a job. They still let me write what I want. As long as that's true. And, you know, I'm not like having things killed or canceled or taken away. I mean, I'm okay. But as for whether the movie industry itself is okay, and this question of what films, what things actually get made these days, I did want to look ahead to, yes, the 96th annual Academy Awards this weekend and ask Wesley what he thought about the last year in film, from Barbie to Oppenheimer, and what it taught us about cinema today and movie stars today. The delusion about the Barbie, the Barbenheimer thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that it's going to lead to more people wanting to go to the movies. I mean, I feel like that's ridiculous because most of the people who were going to those movies used to be moviegoers. It's not like some breed of person was created in the last, you know, and they said this about Top Gun too. I think people, we had a pandemic <laughs> where people were terrified to sit in the dark in a in closed space for a long time with people. That takes some getting used to again. You know, you, I mean, for some people, the pandemic is not over. Right? Correct. It's they're still living with either the ramifications of it or a fear of experiencing whatever they experienced in 2020 or 2020. Yeah, a medical fear. And I think that the sort of cultural reintegration of ourselves back into like enclosed spaces with each other is real. I also think that the movies have to give us a reason to want to go. And there aren't that many. We're all we're already not getting as many movies as we used to get, you know, 15 years ago. That could be good. It also, I don't think for my purposes, it's good at all. If you like movie stars, guess what? You don't have any anymore, right? There's no movie star narrative to like, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to, who is a person? I'm like Alden Ehrenreich. Does that name mean anything to you? I mean, uh, just the Han Solo performance that <laughs> that bummed me out a bit. He's yeah. an Oppenheimer. He's the guy who like is oh, dressing yeah, down course. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy. I mean, we should be on movie on starring movie number seven, right? Miles Teller, same thing. Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan is 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 Adonis Creed for life and Killmonger, right? And I just feel like there are fewer and fewer opportunities for these people to establish persona through movies that are that tell a story across time, right? The idea that Denzel Washington became a star essentially in 1987, there's nobody like that now. The idea of a Tom, like the reason we love Tom Cruise so much is because this dude has not changed. He's still doing now what he was doing mm -hmm. 35 years ago. And happily doing it. And we are happy to see him happy to be doing it too. But... Yes, he's the IP that reboots itself. But is he ever going to play Jerry Maguire again? Mm. Is he ever going to play the duty played in Magnolia? You know, I mean, the question is like, is he ever going to do another... What is that movie, American Made? Where he's the, he's the pilot? I love that movie. He's so good in it. And the movie is pretty solid. American Made, yeah. Um, he's not going to do another one of those because he didn't make enough money. I mean, I don't want to speak for Tom Cruise, but the, but the business imperatives, he wants to win. He, we, we have The Rock, Wesley. Oh, my God. <sighs> go on. Go on, Pablo. <laughs> Talk to me about The Rock. <laughs> well, it feels like, it feels like, objectively, he is our biggest star. Okay, go on. <laughs> Why am I in a corner defending... <laughs> The, I just, the edibility of The Rock. All, all I'm saying is the time that we're living in now mm -hmm. feels for me as a guy who never became a critic despite taking a class about film criticism. It kind of feels like a bit of a bummer. And I am, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I am enjoying the ways in which you are not necessarily feeling that. 
I don't feel, no, no, no. I don't feel, uh, I'm not bummed out, but I also understand that where we're going to be in 10 years with respect to like where we were 20 years ago is going to be really different. Yeah, going to be reviewing AI, like <laughs> AI generated, like well, uh, Tyler I mean, Perry's <laughs> AI generated <laughs> seven part series. I mean, you introduced The Rock as as a continuation of of a thing that that Tom Cruise and Denzel Washington are among the last people to embody. movie star. Yeah, I don't. I think he he missed his. I mean, not that he missed his chance, but like, where's the proof? Like, what's he doing? He's doing. I mean, his sequels. He's no. He's back wrestling now. What I mean, perhaps that's telling the other. I mean, for real, it used to be if we were going back maybe twelve years ago. The WWE needed him to go back way more than he needed it. Now, I think he needs them more than they need him. What is this year in movies defined by what did you find out this year in movies wesley morris and pablo torre finds out what did you find out about cinema this year i i think we that we don't know what it is um we think we know but we don't right mm -hmm. i don't think that knowing is really that important but i also think that we are in a real transition point away from something and you could see it in in just what Barbenheimer meant, but you can also see it like at the end of Core Jefferson's movie American Fiction, right? Where I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but there's a shot that basically is like the movie sort of throwing its hands up and being like, I mean, this is this is what they do. This is all they're gonna do. Yep. It's just this over and over and over again. And I don't know that I necessarily believe that. But I definitely think that the cynical conclusion that it that it draws is is damning of a moment that we are actually in right now, right? Yes. Where it, no matter what you think of of Oppenheimer, the sheer fact of the movie is that it's a movie biography, period, right? It is a movie about a person who did a thing. And the person playing the person who did the thing has to play the person who did the thing. And there are like clear parameters for how to do that thing. Um, and in a completely different realm, you've got a movie like Poor Things, which I think is extraordinary from the standpoint of the eye, um, the ear with respect to the language that the characters use to, to communicate with each other, as, <laughs> particularly Emma Stone. That is a movie star performance. That is a feat of technical acting. You have the bonus of Mark Ruffalo doing something the movie doesn't even need him to do, and he just goes, you know, to outer space with it. I think that the lesson that we're going to learn from all this stuff is more movies based on toys mm -hmm. with respect to Barbie. We were kind of already there, right? But this really put a nail in the coffin for going in some other direction, right? And with, I mean, I think Greta Gerwig... That is definitely one of the five best directed movies I saw last year. There's no question about it. The thing from beginning to end is a unified vision coming from one person Agree. about about this experience of Barbiness, right? And all the ways in which this doll matters both to the community of Barbies, but also to the people who who make them happen in the real world. I think that the lesson to be learned is not that Greta Gerwig is an original voice in American movies. It's that IP, people really want that shit. <laughs> people want a thing they grew up with. People are nostalgic. Pe any any lesson but, but Greta Gerwig is a great American filmmaker and let her do anything she wants. Because you know what she's doing now, don't you? No, what's she I doing? mean, I love her. She can do whatever she wants. I'm not here to question her choices. And I'm sure it's going to be really good. But I think she's doing a Narnia movie. Oh, she's great. going, she's reopening the wardrobe, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't know what in there needs. C.S. Lewis as IP feels feels like. I mean, but it, right. it was already, right? Correct. Like, I mean, they've of made, course. 
this would be a this would be bringing back to life a, a thing reboot. that has been brought back to life in many other iterations. So right. I I trust her, but I also I don't know maybe maybe it's too much to want her to make another Lady Bird. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because Lady Bird is in all the other movies, right? It's in it's in Little Women. It's in Barbie. This is a this is a unified sensibility that we are talking about here. But this is something that I believe that you are familiar with the idea of I'm going to take something that is mainstream and reverse engineerable from a broad consumption standpoint and I'm going to use it as a Trojan horse for some stuff that actually might be interesting. Yes. Also, there's a way that you could just go the opposite direction and just do the thing that is that actually would be interesting, nice. right? That would be nice. Um and so I I'm really curious to see what happens to Justine Trier who made Anatomy of a Fall because the Hollywood people seem to really love her. What happens to Cord Jefferson? Mm -hmm. um, because he's worked in the industry with this amazing magical special. I've thing already that's told Cord, like I expect you to direct a Marvel movie. But and and I you're being <laughs> silly, right? Right. When you you weren't serious. I I was joking, but also as soon as I said the joke, I was like, I bet he's also getting a call about directing a Marvel I'm movie. I'm sure he's getting a call about that. But I think that you watch this movie that this guy made and I don't want to say there's no way he doesn't do it. I mean, he did write The Watchmen. He wrote he wrote a couple episodes of The Watchmen and you know, the one he wrote was it was beautiful. And that show that series is beautiful. So it's not to I don't want to forestall or it. short change Correct. Really what well. it means to go into that world, but that's not my point. My point is I miss when people, when I'm I'm not nostalgic for this, I think it's actually important to our understanding of ourselves to have dramas and comedies that are just about people in situations. And they don't fly. They don't have superhuman strength. They aren't Deadpool, you know, um, which I think those things have their place. But I also wonder, like, what would it look like for somebody to try to do Trading Places now? If that screenplay just landed on some executive's desk right now, what happens to it? Forget Trading Places. What happens to, like, House Sitter? Remember that movie? Mm, With yes. Goldie Hawn and Steve, yes. Steve Martin? I'm not saying these are great works of art, but I don't know. I think that we what we lose when we sort of put our all our eggs in this one basket, and you can see it in the Oscar nominations, is other countries start eating our lunch from the standpoint of the imagination and creativity. That is a great way of putting it. I'm sorry. I mean, we used to have back in my day in America, <laughs> we had imaginations. We are giving something up every day that we stop looking at ourselves as a people in the present um, and start thinking. I mean, I guess there is a kind of reparative work, for instance, that a movie like Oppenheimer is trying to do or that a movie like Killers of the Flower Moon is trying to do. But, you know, and to Scorsese's credit, he's in his 80s, and this is, like, he should be looking back at what violence means and what crime means. This is a meaningful thing for him to do. Um, but, you know, I want to know what it's like to be in 2024. Yeah. I want artists to, like, like show me my present, too. Right, right, know. right, right. You want Russell Wilson to be in the Trading Places reboot. <laughs> Actually, that I mean, he, yeah, there's some part for him in there. It's not, <laughs> it's not Eddie Murphy's part, but there's a there's a role for Russ, Russell Wilson in something. Wesley Morris, before um, I get just furious with you, um, <laughs> I should tell you that I greatly enjoyed this, and I thank you for doing it. Oh, you're gonna get mad about Russell Wilson? I'm just saying. I mean, I value your eye. Thank you. And thank you. I'm like, come on, man. If you had like two percent gay in you, <laughs> you would you would see it. Just two percent. I got like one point nine, and I yeah. feel like it's not doing it. You can you can borrow my point one to get you over that hump. <laughs> uh. <laughs> that's 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 the next episode. Of right, can, finds yeah, out. Let's do it. Out let's do it. being the operative yeah. word. <laughs> This has been Pablo Torre Finds Out, a Meadowlark Media production. And I'll talk to you next time.